Um, welcome to Future Finance. This is Deep Macro's podcast. Um, we uh, draw upon people from our network in data science and in markets um, in order to bring uh, the top issues of the day to uh, you, our viewers. Uh, and so today uh, we have John Lipsky as our guest. Hello, John. Hi, Jeff. Uh, John was the first deputy managing director of the IMF from 2006 to 2011. Uh, and for a couple months in 2011, he was also the acting managing director. Um, if I get any of this wrong, you should just uh, break in and correct me. So far, so um, good. Immediately prior to that, he was the chief economist and head of research uh, for JP Morgan Chase. Uh, and before that, he was the chief economist of Solomon Brothers, uh, which is where we met uh, because John hired me um, into Solomon. <laughs> One of um, the best things I ever did. <laughs> um, and one of the best things I did was to take it. Um, but um, so John has had a lot of experience in both uh, policymaking and academia, um, but also really in the markets, um, forecasting and analyzing inflation, uh, what it means for interest rates, uh, what it means for currencies and asset prices, uh, really kind of in the trenches, um, in addition to being in policy and in academia. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk specifically about inflation um, today. Um, the debate on inflation is really hot right now. Uh, inflation itself is higher than it's been in many, many years. Uh, and I just wanted to ask you, um, first off, uh, the Fed maintains that it's transitory. Uh, what is your view um, on this issue? Um, let's start there. Yes. Well, if you mean, is it transitory or is the inflation we're seeing right now reflecting some temporary factors? And I think the answer is yes, yes, indeed. Will that be the case going forward? It's a more open question. But uh, one way to take a look at this is, yes, there has been a real acceleration, as we've, as we've all seen, in the whichever, basically whatever measure you want, except that the price increases have been very concentrated in just a few, a few items or a few areas like motor vehicles. And in fact, if you use the, uh, the Federal Reserve Dallas, what they call their trimmed mean PCE index, which basically is a fancy way of saying, we take the real outliers and knock them off and, and see if that makes a difference, you'll find that that measure still remains below 2%. The outliers both on the upside and the downside. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. So for example, uh, motor vehicles apparently account for about a third of the acceleration in, in inflation, just that, just that one area. And it's easy to see where those price pressures are coming from. Uh, the lack of supply uh, spilling over into the used car market, et cetera, at a time in which there's been a structure, apparently, at least for the near term, structural increase in demand for autos as people not, uh, became reticent about taking public transit, et cetera. So uh, it, is, it, is it happening? Yes. Is it typical that uh, in a recovery period to see this kind of, uh, of price pressure? And the answer is not really. And if I could go on to say, there are it's an important aspect, I think, of the, it seems to me and, and others, of this acceleration uh, that is quite different than what we typically see in a business cycle. Remember, I always uh, get a little, um, uh, no, not agitated, but it, it, it bugs okay. me that people call this a recession. It, this has not been a typical business cycle, as my my old uh, colleague and friend, Jim Glassman, likes to say, a, a better analogy is a natural disaster, but an odd natural disaster in the sense that it didn't leave massive uh, loss of, of assets, uh, but the economy was sh shut down by fiat or by, by government action by and large and by the associated fear of, of, the, of the COVID disease. Uh, but what was... Uh, Notable was the solidity of the economy right up to the uh, the pandemic's arrival. That the pandemic showed a ability to adapt through let's call it a digital transformation of economic activity, and so in many areas uh, the, that we all know very well, the workforce transferred to a work from home basis in a way that I think. Only months before, people would have said, no, that, that would be very difficult or even unlikely. Uh, the 
uh, uh, promulgated the, the development and promulgation of vaccinations was much more rapid than had been anticipated. And the fiscal support for household income was unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Net result, net result is when the lockdowns went away, as things began to normalize, it turns out demand has recovered rather quickly. And that's a difference from what a typical, let's call a recession, in which there are massive layoffs, et cetera. And uh, another notable aspect in this regard is that a lot of the folks who were, who were unemployed and therefore receiving unemployment uh, were actually furloughed or viewed themselves as furloughed. So even though technically they were unemployed, they didn't feel completely unemployed. They felt like when things open up again, I've got a, I've got a job. And that uh, uh, may have had an important impact. So we've seen a much more rapid recovery in demand. Mm -hmm. Supply, however, in this case, has been impaired for a lot of different reasons. Uh, global supply chains have been disrupted for all the reasons we know. Uh, we did see a, a, a non-trivial amount of uh, attrition of small and medium enterprises. We just look around for those of us who are New Yorkers, you just look around the store, empty storefronts and you see businesses that have gone under. Um, in, with the onset of the pandemic and the uncertainty about what was gonna happen to demand, how long it was gonna last, a lot of businesses that stayed in business cut back substantially uh, on their capacity in anticipation of extended period of weak demand. So what's happened, contrary to what you typically expect, Demand has come back quickly and supply less so. And uh, but the, down from the Fed's point of view, um, the, I, the supply imbalances will work themselves out exactly. um, effectively. Is there any? But that's that's and, and that's the concept. That's the operating concept. Is for for now we don't see gem signs of generalized uh, inflation. Correct. Um, you know the. Uh, Inflation expectations or expectations have, uh, you know, kind of assumed a prominent role uh, in the inflation process. Pretty much everybody uh, believes that, um, but we don't know a whole lot about how uh, expectations are formed. Um, I, I I struggle with this all the time, and so um, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, is there some risk that what we're seeing right now is maybe mistakenly viewed as actual um, inflation? I mean, it's all over the media. Um, um, it is in some uh, things that people buy frequently. Yes. Uh, again, we don't know um, exactly yeah. how the expectations are formed. Um, please go through these uh, issues for us. Oh yeah, this is this is a fascinating uh, area. What wanted to come come to in any case, uh, if the uh, economist who's done terrific work on this and who I, I enjoy uh, reading, listening to, uh, etc. Yuri Gorenichenko of UC Berkeley has done some uh, some challenging and fascinating work on the, exactly the issue. What we've what we've seen over the past decade plus pretty clearly is that central banks don't exactly have neat little dials in which they can control inflation. We all were taught that, that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, may or may not be true, or who knows what that really means. But what's clear is that there's a limit to the fine control of, of central banks or the inflation rate. Um, and this, I think it's probably, well, let me put, just point this out right now at, at this point. Uh, if we take a look at what's happened to U.S. Uh, inflation over the, let's take it since the uh, dot-com downturn, since 1999, if we say we've got a long-term inflation target for the Fed of 2% in the U.S., where are we today relative to that path of 2% a year starting in 1999? We're 3% below. So, if the long-term focus is 2%, we, we're a chunk under. If you wanna measure it from 2007, from the onset of the, of the uh, financial crisis, that same gap, call it that inflation gap against 2% target, 6%. Hence, it's not so surprising for the Fed to start thinking, wait a minute, let's think about doing this in a longer term way and if, if we're trying to guide folks to say, over the long term, we're going to hit 2%. Well, we're, we're going to have to, it, it's not surprising people 
expectations are pretty low because we haven't come close to that. Mm -hmm. So it gives you, a, I think, a view that way, a, a much more sympathetic perspective on, on how, the Fed is, how the Fed is looking at this. But now uh, let's, let's come back to the, to the theme. So where do, where do expectations come from? Well, as, as you know, and I expect most of the listeners here will know, is folks, uh, to my taste, sort of obsess about central banks and especially about the Fed. What did they, did they, uh, uh, Yuri Gorindachenko had just published a, a fantastic paper about analyzing press, Fed press conferences, not for the words they use, but for the body language and the tone of voice that they announce. Okay. And sure enough, there is, he can, he can uh, uh, track a significant market reaction, not a huge one, not a long lasting one, but to these, uns well, to me, it's just, boy, folks are now, really obsessing about what the, what the fact is. Now you're talking does. our language, yes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the record says eh, their control is pretty loose. Uh, so, question all right since inflation expectations are critical where do they come from uh yuri's gone off and had his colleagues done some surveys of households do they pay attention to the fed not a chance they don't they don't know what the fed has done they wouldn't know how they don't know that no average guy pays virtually zero attention attention to the fed in forming inflation expectations how about fiscal policy? Nope, not either. What do most folks form their impression, their inflation expectation on? Not, not unexpectedly. Items that are highly standardized that they purchase frequently, e.g. gasoline, milk, milk, stuff that they're they're buying all the time, and they could even I have can can remember what I paid for gas last time, even though I don't drive much and then. Don't do it very often, but so that's, you get household, you get professional forecasters, the kind of, the folks we talk to who are obsessing about the Fed and looking at the, these details and then businesses. And it turns out in general, household expectations are higher and businesses are someplace between professional forecasters and, and businesses. So how are we gonna influence, inform inflation expectations. And uh, I would say nobody has a clear handle on that, nor a easy lever for control. But what does appear is that at the end of the day, over the last, as I said, since the, the financial crisis, inflation expectations have pretty much matched where inflation has been, which is very low. Mm -hmm. And it's not likely that that's going to uh, uh, turn around quickly, but just different from saying there are no risks. There, there are risks. Right. And um, the Fed's new uh, framework that it came out with last August, uh, yeah. and you referred to, uh, I believe it's flexible average inflation targeting is the exactly. term. Um, part of this was, I think you gave some sympathy that uh, you know inflation has been below that, uh, depending upon where you start, by a certain amount. Um, is that uh, that's, is that something that's easier to come up with when inflation is in fact lower? Um, yeah. Once we get above it, uh, can the Fed maintain it? Is this week a sort of uh, taste of things to come and how difficult it will be to say, um, we're gonna, this is what we wanted uh, and it won't get out of control? Correct. I think it's going to turn out to be uh, a lot harder to deal with if influencing professional forecasters they're going to be asking, oh, average, what's your average over what period? What, how, what's your tolerance for deviation? What, Correct. How are you going? What's the rule you're going to follow? So they're going to be under a lot of pressure when, when that time comes to define what it is they mean. For the time being, I think, not surprisingly, again, given the record, they'll say, well, you know, we'll see it when we, we'll, we'll know it when we see it. Okay. But, uh, because for right now, they know that they want inflation expectations higher. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, I, I should have brought okay, a few I'm going to interrupt here for one second. 
we can come back to the question of it, is 2% the right number? I'm a, I'm a, I know some people who I respect very much who say we need to have higher inflation so that when that trouble comes, the Fed can cut rates and doesn't hit the zero lower bound. I, I, I must admit, I hear, a, I hear an echo of we have to destroy the village in order to save it. But um, uh, it's not completely clear why higher inflation target is uh, easy, is so easy to maintain, uh, et cetera. And people forget that the original, at least my take, for my, my judgment, the original impetus for this was, I'll call it the Boston Commission that said that our, our, despite our best efforts, that inflation measures are not, very, are not all that good, but they're biased upwards uh -huh. and, uh, or sorry, biased, down, biased downwards. So if we hit 2% inflation, that's or something above a positive inflation number, that's the, uh, let's call it analytical equivalent of price stability. Or it hits, it also hits the Alan Greenspan definition of remember of inflation so low that it doesn't distort this long-term business decisions. Correct. Anyway. I mean, are we beginning to, I guess the ultimate question is I, I, I've always liked that operational uh, definition or behavioral definition. Uh, do you think that we're seeing signs that uh, price changes are indeed affecting uh, economic or decision-making? Or is it still, um, we have these t supply side uh, 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 issues, we gotta work them out. Obviously that's something where you want the price signal right. uh, <laughs> so that people produce more of this stuff. That's correct. The, uh, for sure, uh, the, the, again, given the current circumstances in which the, price, the strong price signals are so highly specified, where you can see, as I say, autos, you can see a gap between, uh, uh, supply and demand. But coincidentally, at least on a medium term uh, over the last year or so, the demand for vehicles is not back to where it was pre-COVID. It's the supply effect that is that is very low. So unambiguous effects, but reason to think that should over time cure itself. Right. Sometimes, um, I wouldn't say higher inflation per se, but uh, let's just say easy monetary policy has been wrapped up in um, um, high employment, uh, higher employment, more diverse, more inclusive employment than we even reached uh, kind of at the, at the very peak of uh, the previous cycle, or let's say the interrupted cycle that you mentioned. I mean, before yeah. COVID looks like, um, I, I, I agree that uh, Connor is actually quite strong. Um, but if we do get inflation, um, don't, doesn't that have, tell us about the distributional effect. Um, who is gonna like having higher inflation? Uh, is that going to have any kind of political impacts that um, um, may turn out to be kind of unexpected? Well, uh, let's try to chop that in a couple, a couple bits. Uh, one, one being, uh, and I, uh, I'm attracted by the, the Bob Hall kind of analysis that says what really, what really benefits folks and then has beneficial distributional impact is sustained growth. Mm -hmm. And that that's what keeps employment growing and that naturally spreads, spreads the benefit. And that's exactly what we found pre-COVID, right? That we were getting unemployment rates very low. You were starting to get wage gains at the bottom of the, of the wage distribution, et cetera. So uh, I think it's unambiguous that if you can sustain, if you can sustain growth, it has beneficial effects distributionally. High inf the notion that high inflation or that accelerating inflation sustains the expansion and is positive uh, uh, distributionally, of course, is something that uh, uh, in my, both my training and experience is wrong. High inflation almost always prejudices those who can protect themselves the least from those kind of effects. And that tends to be poor, propertyless, wage earners. Uh, and so it seems to me that high, in, high inflation is a uh, undesirable for, dist for distributional reasons. 
right? Yeah, I mean it. Um, I that doesn't seem to be uh, voiced uh, so often when um, an easy Fed is. Uh, uh, is, um, uh, is uh, I mean, I even hear a lot about how mistaken the tightening cycle that started in 2015 was. I, I, that's, I, I was going to say I should have brought some quotes. Uh, it's very common to think that way. Yeah. Um, I'm not, uh, as you say, if, if, if that helps sustain the, the jobs exactly. expansion, that's, exactly. that's pretty much what you have to do. Yeah, I, I like that Bob Hall, well, I'll call it Bob Hall. <clears throat> sure. The formulation, the key is to sustain growth. Right. Um, you mentioned uh, you've you've mentioned the dials a couple times. Um, yeah. Would you say that compared to let's say the 1990s when when we met, um, do you feel that the Fed uh, either can't or shouldn't try to fine tune as much as uh, uh, they had before? In other words. Um, this has been, uh, it's not just unique to the United States either. Uh, all developed countries have had uh, persistently low inflation. Um, something is out there. Uh, um, even though they've been trying, um, is it demographics, debt, uh, uh, technology? Um, are these structural factors determinant or are they just stronger than we thought? And so they can be offset with a more determined policy. I would say stronger than, stronger than we thought. And uh, I would say one thing we have learned, uh, uh, you, you ask, can and should the, the central bank or the Fed try to fine tune the answer, it seems to me is resoundingly no. But I think in, with all respect, with all respect, they've proven that over the last uh, uh, couple of decades that they don't have the tools, uh, they don't have the ability to fine tune. But I think they they recognize that as well. There might have been a moment of, of hubris, uh, and I thought the the era the era of at least among uh, some academics and maybe even some policymakers of extreme form of inflation targeting, in which highly instrumented rules that uh, supposed some really fine uh, knowledge of how the economy worked and the interaction between all kinds of variables and inflation was very easy to, to influence. Uh, I think that has uh, lost, uh, lost its luster and uh, reasonably so. Mm. But, but the, the Fed, the central bank's long-term inflation goals and their willingness to take action over time uh, does strike, does seem to have some have some importance, but it's not the whole story or even close to the whole story. Okay. So I, I think this is a time where I, I really just have to ask, uh, let's call it the Japan question. Uh, we started to talk about other uh -oh. countries. <laughs> um, How about that? How about those Japanese? <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, obviously I was uh, in yes. Japan working for you, at Solomon. Yeah. And um, I mean, for a while, I think it was sort of easy to sort of poke fun or at least to you know, say, well, they're not doing this, that, and the other thing, but I don't know, last 10 years, they caught up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and d d what lessons, uh, is that still a, or the, you know, the failure to even come close to 1%, let alone sustainably, uh, let alone 2%, is it unique? Uh, is it a, is it something about um, the tools? Uh, um, what can you tell us yeah. about the Japan question? Yes. Well, I should be asking you. Uh, you lived it, but it's. Uh, me I asked the questions here. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, it seemed to me that the, 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 the factors of importance. Um, after, let, let's start from the bursting of the bubble, of the Japanese bubble of the 80s, and the, the really sharp setback uh, that at the beginning of the 90s. And again, correct me if you disagree, some sustained failures of the Bank of Japan mm -hmm. to respond even to their own monetary targeting that they let the monetary aggregates uh, uh, contract and uh, continue well below any, any rational notion of uh, a plausible expansion. And I think that helps set expectations of uh, of deflation or uh, let's call it de modest deflation, exacerbated by the demographics, exer exacerbated, I think, by the, uh, the sense of uh, uh, worry about the stability of social safety net, 
the tendency to want to acquire foreign assets, uh, all of that in the 1990s, I think was a kind of a witch's brew that uh, got very entrenched before they're trying to get out. And now they're trying to get out in a context in which the, um, the worries I think about long-term demographic trends remain, remain pr pretty powerful. It turns out it's hard to turn those around. Uh, I think our, I'm going to suspect that the most folks turn, tuning in this are cognizant, however, as you sort of suggest, at the, um, the notion that somehow the Japanese were failing in, uh, to maintain productivity, et cetera. Uh, we've all, I think, heard that and looked at the data that says, well, pro productivity per capita of the working population has been the strongest of all the advanced economies, it's the productivity per capita that has been uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, weak. Right, because there's a lot of capitas not working anymore. <laughs> because there are a lot of capitas not working, exactly. Right. So it's um, to say we know, we know what to do, uh, it's, um, it seems very been very, very hard uh, for them to, to reverse that, even with the uh, incredible effort, sustained effort, uh, and I would say really pioneering effort, right? Mm -hmm. by, the, by the Bank of Japan to finally try to correct things with not just zero interest rates for policy rates, explosion in the balance sheet, acting to keep long-term rates minimal. Uh, if, if monetary policy was uh, able to do, to really change things, then you would think they would have shown much more great, much greater change in Japan. And I, I would also add, it's not just been the Bank of Japan. I mean, this was blessed by a change of government, um, yes. a change of party, uh, a, 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 you know, by Japanese standards, a very dynamic uh, leadership and kind of united, joined at the hip on the fiscal side. Um, and nonetheless, it hasn't quite caught fire like uh, we might have expected. Um, if you look at expansion of balance sheet versus change of price levels, uh, you know, nowhere near what, you know, anybody would have thought, say, 20, 30 years ago in terms of bang for the buck. Yeah, exactly. That is, I, get, uh, I can interject here because that's sure. uh, you, you provided the opening, but when the magic words balance sheet, I just want to be sure that we get this in. Hmm. One of the things that absolutely is, has to be thought about, and I don't think it's clear what the explanation is, has been the rapid growth in M2 in the US. So it was, uh, remember in the wake of the global financial crisis, there was an initial, there were some folks who were saying, oh my goodness, the expansion of the Fed balance sheet, eventually it's gonna turn into to inflation, maybe high inflation, maybe hyperinflation, this is gonna be a disaster, they can't blah, blah, blah. And of course, didn't happen, dog didn't bark. Uh, that was at that, when you look back, that the expansion of the balance sheet did not result in money supply acceleration. Right. It's, so it's this time it is. Is that important? Not clear, not clear. What is clear, of course, or one, one possible explanation is because the magnitude of the Fed's intervention in, in capital markets has been so much larger that this is, in essence, the monet, we're seeing the monetization of, uh, of the fiscal deficit right. in, in that way. An alternative explanation is that there, the, because of the maintenance of household income, but the tendency towards uh, spending, sustaining spending on durables, but the un unavailability to uh, obtain services or, or reticence in going to, a, a, or impossibility or reticence to going to someplace public and obtaining services means that folks in fact have got pent up demand and it's been expressed in the form of additional uh, cash balances in the part of households or businesses, especially households. Um, that's a rather benign explanation that says as things open up, as people renormalize their spending, as the provisions of services go up, the demand for services will go up and these money balances will, will tend to normalize. Um, so do we know the right answer? 
No, right now we don't. Uh, other than we don't see the signs, the clear signs that this is going to turn into generalized inflation. Right. But it seems like we should uh, blow the dust off of the textbooks of M2 uh, uh, supply uh, quantity, let's say. Uh, I think what you're telling us from a practical perspective is uh, there may be something here. It could reflect uh, fiscal risks that uh, people have talked about but have not really seen, right. uh, which does lead me to final. I, I did want to talk about risks. And you mentioned, you know, my base yeah. case is here, but there are risks. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, especially when you think about the fiscal side, uh, which you just, you, you know, the, the M2 growth, uh, the possibility that this is monetizing, monetizing some of the fiscal deficit, uh, just the generally close um, um, uh, relationship. Um, I mean, if you can tell anything about the risks, um, if you wanted to speculate about, um, should we be hedging? Uh, uh, is it natural for is it natural for people to hedge? And does that hedging activity in itself tend to uh, put a little bit of fuel onto the fire? Well, let me, um, we can put let's put it in the following context. Yeah. Are, is this back to the seventies? Good question. And, right. We just you know sure. rhetor rhetorical, but yep. hey, inflation seemed to come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Are we running the same kind of risks? What, when you look back, what was mistaken? Output gap. It's clear looking back at the 70s, a decision that there was an underestimate, an overestimate, sorry, overestimation of the output gap. Folks thought that there was, more, there was more to spare than there is. Are we doing that again? No, what we've shown is we're not very good ex ante at, uh, uh, at, at really measuring the output gap in a, in a reliable way. But the risk is that the amount of fiscal spending potentially could be very large relative to any reasonable assumption of the, of the output gap. Now that's an argument that Larry Summers has been making. Correct. And uh, part of that depends on, well, is that, is that a big, a big risk? Depends on how big the output gap really is, which we, don't really know. And uh, it depends on how much of the spending actually that's been proposed actually gets, it actually happens. But there's one risk that we we're gonna, that was a 70s risk. Second, in the 70s, price expectations, inflation expectations are well in. The answer to that is, you know, yep, until they're not. And then when we're not, they're not getting them re-anchored it turns out required crushing the economy to get that done. It wasn't just twisting the dials, it was hammer. And it took, a, remember, it took a lot of false starts, the Fed's angry eights, mm -hmm. and uh, until Paul Volcker said, we're gonna put a stop to this business, but it hurt, it hurt a lot. Um, what, would, what, what could unmoor expectations, well, Commodity prices going up. Uh, uh, that uh, that changes business perceptions of inflation risks. That leads them to start putting up prices. That uh, et cetera, et cetera. Could this get started? Yeah, it could. Yeah, it could. Are commodity prices that powerful? Eh, not really. But but would you say uh, don't pay attention? No, I think you should pay some pay some attention. Should they be sustained? The answer is, I don't think so, but um, it's, it's worth thinking about. Um, the, what, what other things uh, happened, happened back then? Uh, the uh, uh, wages uh, started, uh, started to accelerate. I personally keep thinking, well, what we've seen over the past few decades is a trend strengthening of the profit share of GDP and a decline in wage, labor share of GDP. But I didn't hear folks saying how inflationary that was. Why, I'm never quite clear on why if wage if labor share of GDP is recovering, that's inherently inflationary. Mm -hmm. And it's not obvious to me. On the other hand, uh, wages are accelerating and it could result in, again, an, a resetting of inflationary uh, expectations. 
And what, I, what I've said and has been implicit in what we've, this discussion is that the policy, the, the credibility of the policy commitment of the, um, uh, of, of the Fed, of the central bank, towards a specific inflation goal is critical or potentially powerful, not all powerful, but potentially powerful in this, in this regard. But again, this back to the 70s idea was, yeah, but back then all of a sudden the policymakers decided that they were suffering from cost push inflation and there really wasn't anything they could do about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what we ended up when push came to shove, the central bankers were perfectly capable of saying, yeah, it's my, yeah, I, yeah, I see this happening, but you, you understand it's not my fault. So here, there, there is a kind of a, a litany of risks uh, that says, watch out, because if that, if there was a deterioration in expectations, that produced a rise in interest rates, would undoubtedly have an effect on uh, the huge mass of variable rate debt and a huge mass of, of debt in both household and corporate debt that have been issued in the, in the recent past uh, that could end up creating cost pressures that would be difficult to, uh, uh, to reverse. Big picture, I think the, the, the best uh, guide right now is, I think the Fed's judgment is a reasonable one, transitory, not, not a risk, need to sustain the, the expansion, uh, haven't produced demand growth that is outsized relative to potential supply, and that this should rebalance over time, but we can't take it right. for granted and can't assume that if you've made a mistake, correction is easy. That's, a, that's the, other, the other message that bothers me a little bit is that the Fed, uh, not just the Fed, but central bankers have concluded yeah, we're not so great at counteracting deflation. That's a tough one, but we're good at stopping inflation. And I said, well, the record shows it's, it, it ain't costless. It takes a while and it's very expensive. Yeah. Exactly. I wouldn't overdo it. I wouldn't right. overdo it. Right. But, yeah. but still, yeah. Well, but, isn't there also, I mean, when you, um, uh, the whole thing about, you know, it's easier for the Fed to talk about average inflation targeting when inflation is low. I mean, there's a social, isn't the social backdrop of uh, tolerance for inflation quite a bit different than 1970s? I mean, um, I mean, I don't want to overstate the labor unions and, and you know, and that that element of it. But um, I would would the pub is the Fed really saying two percent, or is the Fed basically taking that from society uh, that we are a different type of uh, polity, uh, you know, political economy than we used we're to old, be? Exactly. We're an older society. We're an older society, and a huge number of people have allied. Uh, have arranged their personal finances, including their most pressing financial obligations on the expectation of sustained low inflation. And it strikes me that that's, that is something that is different from the past, certainly from the 70s, that there would be a, a rise in interest rates, a rise in real interest rates would produce pressures both in the government, but on personal finances that folks would find very uncomfortable. Right. So I do think that the Fed would find itself under a lot of pressure not to let interest rates go up. <clears throat> I'd say that music was better in the 70s, though. It's your 70s? Come on. <laughs> 60s. But 60s, the, uh, okay. All right. Hey, um, you, know what, uh, you know what deadheads say when they run out of dope? <laughs> uh, hey. No. Hey, this music sucks. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so we'll be aware of the risks then, um, for sure. Um, yes. Look, uh, that's been great. I really appreciate uh, your time today, John, um, and uh, insights. Uh, really okay. fascinating. Okay. And I think um, we'll have to see how this thing goes uh, three months from now. Um, inflation higher? I mean, will these supply? I mean, is there a way to say? I mean, it seems like this stuff should be working its way out. I mean, you're right about the semis can't turn on. Yeah. I don't know. I ordered a refrigerator and I was told four months. And it's like oh, four months for a refrigerator? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. so those are the kind of things that have got to balance. That they they got to balance yeah, out. Sure. Which means has the price gone up? Oh, you betcha. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Will it continue to go up and up for refrigerators? Probably not. Not unless there's a sense of general inflation that is ratified in the general public. And hopefully that isn't going to happen because come back to the, to the bottom line is how, what we've learned is how important for social well-being and well, social welfare to sustain the expansion. The content is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. Nothing contained in this material constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, endorsement, or offer by Deep Macro Incorporated or any third-party service provider to buy or sell any securities or other financial instruments in this or in any other jurisdiction in which such solicitation or offer will be unlawful under the securities laws of such jurisdiction. All content is information of a general nature and does not address the circumstances of any particular individual or entity. None of the information constitutes professional and or financial advice, nor does any of the information constitute a comprehensive or complete statement of the matters discussed or the law relating thereto. There are risks associated with investing loss of principal as possible. Some high-risk investments may use leverage, which will accentuate gains and losses as securities or firms pass investment performance. Is not a guarantee or predictor of future investment performance.